Thank you for joining our roundtable series. Over the next few weeks, Professor Francois Verulli and Rob McGaffin will be interviewing industry leaders. These are challenging and uncertain times, and we hope that the views and opinions expressed by these people will help you to formulate your own plans and strategies to ensure that your property business remains sustainable into the future. Uh, with COIN, we are going to be running a, a number of online discussions, seminars, where we will be discussing the property market, We'll be looking particularly at uh, work trends, how the property market is being affected by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but, but I think what is equally important is that we're going to use the opportunities to also look at some of the trends that already existed in the South African property market, which are possibly being accelerated at the moment. Today we have with us uh, Richard Edwards and Alan van Westhuizen, who will be introducing themselves in a moment. Um, we we'll also have with us Robert McGaffin, who will be uh, co-hosting uh, this particular session with me. Um, and so between the two of us, um, we will be asking the questions and we will have our panelists responding to us. Let's, and really our aim here is to keep it as much as possible uh, as a discussion. Um, and let me therefore start by with Richard and um, ask you, Richard, uh, if you could just uh, introduce yourself. And I think what would be interesting to start off our discussion is to, to really give us a sense of some of the issues that you are thinking about at the moment. Uh, in the property market. You are very central in the property market through the funding uh, of, of this sector. Uh, and I'm sure that you must be seeing some uh, interesting trends at the moment. Thanks, Francois. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invite. Um, I look forward to a good robust discussion. I think things are changing by the hour, never mind by, by the days and by the weeks. Um, so I look after property finance for the Western and Eastern Cape for, for NetBank. You know, obviously having a big market share that we do, we are able to pull a lot of data and a lot of information in terms of where the market is at the moment. So obviously a big priority of ours, you know, ever since late March, early April, has been talking to all our big um, property landlords, just looking at help them restructure a lot of their loan facilities with additional working capital, to help them over this time. Um, you know, and the first focus was really around the retail sector, shopping center landlords, followed hotly by the hospitality industry, where you know, we know hospitality will be probably the last sector to eventually open up. Um, and retail, you know, mixed stories around the nationals and the smaller tenants. So that's been our priority for probably the last um, six to eight weeks. Um, and now we're starting to see requests coming from some of our commercial clients, some of our office clients, um, or office landlord clients. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and I think what's already starting to come through here is that our particular sectors, and probably all the sectors, are not feeling this environment in, in an equal way. Uh, and I think that'll be, that'll be very interesting once we start our discussion about the type of space um, and when, when we start looking at sectors. Alan, can I move on uh, over to you? Um, yeah, a bit of an introduction for, from your perspective and uh, the sort of issues that you're dealing with. Perfect. Uh, thanks very much, Prof, and uh, thanks for having me on, on this uh, seminar. Um, as, as you've said, Alan van der Westhuis, and I'm, uh, I represent a company called IWG, the International Workplace Group. Um, we are formerly known and, and better known in South Africa as, as Regis. Um, and we are, for, for, for want of a better description, we are um, the world's biggest provider of um, serviced office and co-working spaces. So we've obviously, uh, coming into this year, enjoyed uh, a lot of good growth, particularly over the last couple of years, um, just because of the, the, the sort of the change in the work environment. And then come into March or towards the end of March in South Africa and realize that um, 
that landscape has changed quite dramatically. And, and you know, how does that affect us? Uh, how do we sort of future-proof ourselves uh, for it, for this kind of possibility in the future? How do we, um, how do we take advantage of it coming out of it? And um, one of the things that we have acknowledged is that within the commercial office space market that um, this, this pandemic has caused or is, is given, uh, given reason to a lot of CEOs and accountants to, to rethink their business models, to rethink their, their lease agreements, to rethink how they uh, want to create a professional work environment for their employees. So, um, you know, our thinking really is around how do we how do we offer a solution to to companies that are that are rethinking their strategies going forward? Thank you, Alan. Uh, let me immediately move on to Rob McGaffin. Um, Rob, um, a question from from your side. Thanks, Franz. So just Rob McGaffin from the Urban Real Estate Research Unit. Um, perhaps a. A question to Richard, but I suspect Alan may, may have some I, some views on this as well. Richard, you're also uh, a landlord in the sense of your own staff. You, obviously, the banking and finance sector obviously occupies a lot of space in itself um, and has a lot of employees. How has the virus or how is the virus changing your views of how you accommodate your own staff? Okay, so we started a program roughly about 18 months ago to look at rationalizing all of our office space across the country. I won't talk about the branch network because that's obviously a different, different animal. But um, we've actually had to fast track, you know, this whole sort of consolidated workspace. Um, so much so if we just look at our property business in Cape Town, we have a staff complement of about 90 people, of which 87 of us work from home um, out of the 90. So in the space of two weeks, just prior to the lockdown, we managed to get IT to set up everybody to be able to work remotely from home. And bearing in mind, you know, we have a lot of security issues around cybercrime and uh, firewalls, et cetera, et cetera. So we managed to put that into, into place really quickly. And it's highly likely we're going to carry on working like that until the lockdown is over completely. Even if we move to stages three, two, and one, um, we just can't get the social distancing aspects in our office right in terms of two meters between each employee. It's just practically impossible. And um, things are working well. We're managing to get turnaround times you know, probably far quicker than we would have if we were all working in the office environment. Um, unfortunately, you don't get the social distractions, but um, you know, we found people at their computers at seven o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night. Um, so it's been a massive change in a very short space of time and um, it's proven to be really beneficial. Richard, it, it's, it's an interesting point that you're raising and maybe Alan can also um, touch on this. Um, first is the fact that I've heard that when you work online, five hours of working at home directly onto your computer is equivalent to eight hours of work in the office because of the time that you spend doing um, other things, you know. But, but I think that there's another issue, and I suppose, is there a risk with all of this that you start, how can I put it, losing the corporate culture? That you start, um, you know, when you walk into an bank office, you know where you are, you're in the culture, that you start losing a bit of that. Uh, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or, or Alan. I mean, that's co-working, the idea of co-working. That does it, and I suppose the issue that you just raised about security, how things get, get handled, and I suppose if you are large enough, you can do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I think it's, it's two aspects, not only um, the corporate culture, it's the social interaction that all humans, you know, enjoy. Um, so obviously that's going to be a concern going forward. And until such time as the laws or the regulations are relaxed, we're just going to have to continue to work and interact with each other on an ongoing basis. I mean, we had a farewell for a staff member last, um, last Friday, and we had 70 people dial into a, a Skype farewell. Um, right. uh, the things are possible, but sure, going forward, you know, it's just how people are feeling um, mentally, um, missing the social interaction, 
am I still valuable to the company because I'm not engaged as, a, as often as I used to be when I was walking around the office? So those are all real issues that we are looking at at the moment, definitely. Alan, do you want to come in on this? I mean, it does co-working lead to completely different dynamics um, uh, and culture? Do you start picking up the culture of your co-working uh, uh, supplier rather than your corporate supplier, rather than your, the corporate that you happen to be working with? Alan, I suppose the question that I would have for you is, is there a risk that uh, uh, those who work at Regis, for example, start picking up the Regis culture rather than the culture of, of their service provider? You know, is there, um, and what's, what could happen there? Uh, Security-wise, uh, you, especially if you're on a very secure network in your corporate head office, does all of that change? Uh, no, I don't think it's changed, uh, Prof. I think what's happened is that, you know, uh, corporate culture, uh, to a large extent, does happen inside sort of the, the, the walls of the office. But, um, you know, that, it transcends well beyond that. And I think a lot of people are learning that, that working remotely uh, can be a lot more efficient and you can, you can still um, you can export that, that sort of corporate culture, not only uh, around the country, but globally. So... I think that continues. What it does do, um, as opposed to being a risk, it creates a, an opportunity for, for collaboration. So you get a lot of people working in an environment where potentially they can collaborate with other service providers that might add value to their business um, or that there might be some synergy with. So uh, corporate culture, potentially you lose a bit of it, seeing the same people in the office every day and meeting around the coffee machine, but you, you, you meet a different group of people around the coffee machine now and uh, potentially not, not in the same uh, office in, uh, or the same industry. Um, but I, I do, I think that you do retain uh, to a large extent that, that cor corporate culture, but you, you, you become a lot more efficient if, uh, in, in the way you work. Rob, um, yeah, for you. Thanks, Franz. So just to pick up on that, Alan, and just speaking about the co-working space, I mean, in my head, I could see these trends going in one of two directions because, you know, there's sort of pros and cons against it. So, I mean, on the one, do you see that there will be increased demand for co-working space in the sense that from a, a real estate point of view, people that have to be tied into the same long leases, et cetera, et cetera. So, they are, you know, there's less of a threat or a risk uh, in terms of something like a, a COVID-19 happening there and, and they tied into a long-term lease. Or the other way though is that people may not want co-working space purely from a perceived health risk point of view. Do you have a views on, on either of those? Rob, Rob you know what, what has crossed my mind and then we'll, uh, Richard, we'll, we'll also move on to some of the, uh, the other sectors is do we walk out of this and saying working from home is actually not that great? Huh? Um, you know, uh, I want a bit of diversity in my life. Um, so, so, so yes, maybe, maybe we'll walk out of here thinking it's all highly efficient, or we say, well, well, well can, I, can, I, can I come in and answer on that? Is that, um, but uh, to Rob and to Prof, I think that um, from, from a co-working perspective, uh, the, 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 the name indicates that you sort of work in, a, in, a, in an environment, an open office environment, where, in fact, particularly in the Regis centres, we are... We're a shared office and we're a serviced office environment, but we're not necessarily, we have a very small sort of co-working business lounge area. So people are still, will still be, uh, still have their own office space. They'll still be able to, to practice social distancing and, um, and, and, and follow hygiene protocols. Um, but what it does do is it, it eliminates people having to travel long distances. It eliminates, um, uh, sort of unnecessary uh, rental on, on large spaces or large offices where you can have um, satellite or hub and spoke teams uh, in, in, in various regions around the country still operating as efficiently. Um, and and um, there was a point that you had said, Prof, now uh, with regards to... Uh, maybe, to maybe it's not they, that great. Maybe sitting oh, oh, about working from home is that you know working from home is great, 
uh, you can literally get up uh, and, and, and you can start working in your pajamas. But the, the reality is that at some stage, you're going to need the office automation. You may need a printer. You may need to, to, to send a, you know, the courier services or whatever. And, um, and that's what co-working uh, seeks to, to provide. It seeks to share those services amongst a whole lot of different companies or, or um, uh, employees. And ultimately, um, you know, you create a, you still have a, a professional work environment, but you're working sort of more remotely or, or closer to home. Yeah, I, I suppose we can discuss it a bit later. You know, it's, it's nice if you have a house with a little uh, lounge or office that you can work for when it's you with three children and you're using the dining room table. Um, maybe that's the offering of going to a co-working environment looks a bit more attractive. Um, Richard, um, let, me, let me move to you. I mean, you see in your work a lot of sectors. I mean, as you know, I think you're across uh, all the sectors of the South African property market. Um, I suppose the point I'm making is that some of the things that we're discussing at the moment are not necessarily new. I mean, co-working, sharing, are things that we've been seeing in the last two, you know, certainly a few, few years. Um, maybe your, your observations, even on the retail sector, are you seeing uh, people saying, oh, well, I'm going to go and do something completely different. Or um, I've even heard, what was it, Pick and Pay suggesting that people are now shopping across the week because I think we've lost the weekend dimension in all of this. Uh, I'll go on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Saturday. Um, any thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, I think, you know, until we get back to normality, whenever that is, you know, I think a lot of people will stay away from the bigger malls and just pop down to, you know, their convenience center to do their grocery shopping once a week, and that's it. Um, you know, social distancing and crowds is a is a massive issue that you just need to avoid at the moment. So, and, yeah. and as far as DCs, distribution centers, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of talk. This this is again going to push the logistics sector even further. Uh, yeah, so we've, you know, we've obviously chatted to all our big clients and the sector that seems to be the least impacted at the moment is the logistics and distribution centers. Um, you know, I suppose that the nature of their business is distribution um, and they're able to get out and about to, to do what they need to do. So if you, yeah. if you sort of had to rank the various industries or the sectors in terms of sort of risk at the moment, logistics and distribution is probably at the bottom of the, that risk um, scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 it's interesting. There are also commentary saying, yeah, you know, with a slowdown in the economy, the industrial sector picks up, picks that up the first. Uh, but so it'll be interesting to see the long-term trends um, as well uh, as as the short-term uh, trends. Um, and then, of course, I, I would imagine in the short-term, hotels, restaurants, those those are sectors that are probably even going to be take longer to come back than necessarily the office. I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Richard. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest issues for retail landlords at the moment is, is trying to keep their tenant base. You know, so sure, the bigger, you know, the bigger tenants are able to, you know, pay part of their rental or utilities, recoveries, etc. But it's quite important for the landlord to make sure that these smaller operators, uh, the takeaways, the restaurants, um, the entrepreneurial shops are still there post lockdown. Because trying to replace them post lockdown with new tenants, you know, given where the economy is, it's going to take you six, 12, 18 months to find a replacement tenant. So it's almost better to forego an income from those tenants now, knowing that when things open up again, they'll have those tenants back there. Yeah, Richard, because I think there's been talk, and I don't know how accurate that number is, that maybe even in the office, if you lose a tenant in today's environment, uh, who did I see the other day giving? six months free rental or something uh, just to try to just try to keep the tenant it can take you up to 18 months of income marketing for eight months tenant installation yeah, yeah. focus piece uh really speaking to your point that's if you lose a tenant in this environment you could be out for over a year's income uh, on that space uh, quite easy very easy well 
Well, so just a couple, I just want to pick up on a point that Alan, I think, made. Um, Alan, are you suggesting, based on your previous comments, that we're likely to see more decentralized uh, satellite offices? In other words, a company will have, will not go for one large kind of headquarters centrally located, et cetera, but will more, you know, have a multi-nodal type of a setup uh, closer to people's homes? Um, so even if they are working from home, the ability to come in for that office automation, et cetera, et cetera, you know, you're going to have some, you know, something out in the northern suburbs and southern suburbs. And you also aren't at, at such a greater risk if there is a problem in the head office, you don't have to close down your entire company. Yeah. So the, the answer is yes, Robert. Uh, I, I do think that that thought has always been on the minds of, uh, of management and, and particularly a lot of the employees, you know, there, there's a lot of obvious advantages to it. Um, but I think that it's just been, you know, we've been quite comfortable up until now and um, people have been in their leases and they've, and they've had their office space and it's just, it's been sort of, um, I guess, force of habit. Um, but now what has happened is it's forced us to, 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 to operate slightly differently and it's forced us to think differently. Um, and what has come out of this is that people realize that they can operate probably as efficiently. Um, in some cases, they can be a, a lot more focused. Um, and, and things like what the office environment sought to do was, was bring people together so that you could collaborate and that you could discuss things around a, a table and if you needed to. But what's happened now is that... Um, People have realized you, you can do it as we are now, um, as efficiently and, and uh, as effectively um, through online uh, video conferencing and that. So I think it's opened, opened eyes and, and, and changed perception. And I do believe that uh, that will be the catalyst going forward uh, to potentially to, to the, the next phase of growth in, in um, co-working or serviced offices. Let me... Let me take that point uh, a step further. I mean, the, the traditional business case in real estate has been pretty much selling GLA, square meters of space. And many years ago, you would pay a certain rental and that would be just about it. Bring in your desks and get the, and get the people to work. Um, I think that we're, we're changing, and I suppose the analogy that I often make is that when I book a hotel room for two nights, what doesn't cross my mind is that I'm renting X number of square meters for two nights. Uh, I'm paying because I expect a certain level of service, and I'm pay, I would pay a different rate at a five-star hotel than a two-star hotel. So I suppose the question that, that I am asking myself is that as we start looking at the way that the real estate sector works, and, and maybe Richard, your view is this, will, will property companies start looking more like hotel companies than, than property companies going forward? Will the money be, be made from the services uh, that are offered uh, rather than from the square meters. Yes, indirectly, I suppose there's square meters behind it. Um, I don't know, what are your thoughts, Richard? Do you have any thoughts on, on this? I mean, it, is, is this going to be more of a service provision? At, at the moment, the property owners are leaving that over to others to actually do. Uh, and say, well, you go and play the upside. We're still in the square meter game here. Uh, um, or, or are we going to see, uh, even some of our property companies are not particularly well known. I know a Redison, I know a, a Goldenfield, but do I know, well, I happen to know them, because it's my interest, but uh, does, do people know the, the property companies uh, out there? Uh, any views on this from either of you? Uh, is something going to change here? Or is something changing? Alan? Can I come in there? Yeah, Prof. Um, uh, absolutely. I, I do think that it's, that it's going to be an evolution from, as you say, from the square meterage game more to the occupancy game. 
Um, I think that uh, our model has already uh, moved over from that. You know, we used to look at, at, at sort of a, an, an occupancy rate per square meter. Um, but it's, it's really more just about an occupancy rate now and, 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 and occupancy per workstations. As a hotel, would, you know, a hotel has a certain number of rooms. They don't sell you a square meterage. Uh, they sell you a bed. And we sell you a works. Well, we'll we'll do a contract for a workstation. So, uh, I do think that that there is that there's going to be that natural sort of um, that evolution away from 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 selling square meterage. Um, it's difficult in a property uh, in a property market to to try and do that because um, because that's essentially what what you are selling is is you selling space. Um, but the minute you start adding some kind of value to that space, whether you, you know, you put in a receptionist or you put in the office automation or whatever it is, you know, you, hospitals don't need to be owned. Uh, they, 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 and and they, they would look at this. You, you could let out a, a space to, a, to a medical service provider and then they could just add the value to that and then provide that, uh, those shared services to a whole host of different medical practitioners. You know, and, and so not only in, in our space, but in, in medicine, there's um, across a whole diff a number of sectors, you'll see that, that people start looking at, at, um, at a sort of occupancy over, over square meterage. Richard, just, just for you, there's been talk over the last few years about mixed use developments, mixing up retail, office, all in one building. And I suppose over the years, I suppose the banking sector has had different views about that. You're talking about different risks uh, of integration, vertical integration of, of use. Um, would you have any thoughts about that? Has, has that thinking on mixed use uh, change is still preferable to have an office separated from a retail because they're, they're very different um, uh, things that, that yeah, very different risk, risk profiles. Um, from a risk profile, you actually find you, you've spread your risk across different sectors in, in the same geographic node, so to speak. So I think you reduce your risk overall. But mm -hmm. I think it's the whole concept of work, live, play in the same environment and try and reduce the amount of time you spend commuting, that you have more time to do, you know, your social, your social things that you want to do. Um, you know, we work in the waterfront down at the clock tower. Although we are a standalone office block, we have apartments next to us. We have retail on the ground floor somewhere. We have a gym, et cetera, et cetera. So it already feels like a, you know, a totally um, entwined environment there. Rob, anything for, uh, that you'd like to add? I think we'll take a few more questions and then we'll start wrapping up. Um, so, um, yeah, just two really from my side. One to Richard. I mean, Richard, based on the discussion that we've just been having um, in this uh, series, and I, I'm preempting this for a discussion that we'll have in more detail around the financing of property going forward, but maybe as a, a teaser, you can give us some views. I mean, this must start to fundamentally change how one assesses uh, how bankable projects, et cetera, are. Because I think some of the old models of a particular pre-let percentage, um, as well as the fact that one is often relying on particular contractual rental escalations to be able to do the repayment profiles that are needed on particular projects, now, obviously, if leases are becoming a lot shorter, et cetera, et cetera, in the process, that starts to change the game from a financing point of view. Any views on that? I think if you're talking specific um, to the office sector, then definitely. Um, although, you know, I think two interest rate reductions this year have definitely helped the overall model. You know, it's anyone's guess as to where valuations are going at the moment. We've made a call not to value anything at the moment. <laughs> You're looking into a crystal ball that's full of clouds. Um, so we'll wait until things improve and we get a better clarity be before we start looking at revaluations on our on our properties and our portfolios. Um, and you know, I suppose shorter term leases would just be a nature of the way the market's moving. And 
you would then fall back to who your landlord is, the financial strength, the level of equity that's gone into, into that specific project. And, you know, how marketable is that specific node from, a, from an office perspective? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Alan, do you want to add anything to, to that? Um, and I think we'll, we'll be... Yeah, not, not so much, uh, Prof, to, to, to valuations and that, but uh, I do want to, if I may, just sort of come back to your, to your point quickly on, on um, mixed-use developments, is that we, we did some research uh, in 2019 that, that really indicated that the centres that perform, our centres that perform the, the best are the ones that, are, that have certain synergy factors, uh, like residential and um, retail space close by, um, which, which is a good indication that, that, that people like to have that convenience, like to don't necessarily want to be traveling um, or spending a lot of time commuting. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I think mixed use developments uh, potentially from, a, from a, a, an investment, an, a real estate investment point of view will become more attractive in the future. Yeah, you know, I think what's coming through in this discussion is really it's, it's, it's where we will work, what time we will work, how we will work. And I, bet, and I think these are questions that we are asking throughout uh, the economy. So, yes, we may well have an economy that uh, will start looking different. But I suppose what I, what I would just caution in my own mind is that we've got to be very careful that we think that all of this started because of COVID-19. I think that there was a trend that was already, whether it is e-retailing, whether it is work practices, that, that, that were already come, coming our way. And I suppose what we are doing is accelerating the process. I think what I'd like to do is slowly wrap up uh, the session. Um, and um, I suppose what I'd like to do is just to have some final thoughts from you. Yes, we have an economy that could be down between 6 and 10% uh, in the short run. Uh, um, is it an economy that will come out of this the same way? Um, are we going to see a restructuring uh, a push for the restructuring of our businesses and we'll walk out of this with an economy that will grow but will look uh, very different. And I suppose the issue is also um, a point that, that Alan, you also raised, um, and that is where work will take place. Are we going to be moving more into property developments in our suburbs, smaller developments, um, uh, neighborhood shopping centers that seem to be keeping up fairly well uh, certainly in the 2019 numbers. Um, I think, let me just do the circle. Let me start with, with, with Rob, then move on to Alan and finish with Richard. Rob, any final thoughts as we start wrapping this up? Not so much a thought, Francois, but maybe a final question that I could put to the panelists as such and to pick up on your point that, yes, this virus has accelerated particular existing trends. But I'm curious from the panelists if they're seeing any new trends, uh, something completely different, something left field that's come about as a result of the virus, as opposed to the virus stimulating existing trends. From our side, or from our side, Robert, uh, we ha I think it's still too early to, to sort of tell if there's, there's any significant trends that have emerged as a result of uh, the, the pandemic. Um, but I do concur with your points on the fact that, that uh, what's happened is we've seen an acceleration of the way uh, people are going to start working remotely, um, be it from home or, or from, from flexible office spaces. But I also think that what will happen is that to go back to, to sort of the, the, the risk of being, uh, being bound to a long-term lease, um, what will happen is people will start looking at options where there is a bit more flexibility, where they may not have to commit to five or ten years, and they could they could commit to six or, or, or six months or a year, um, and potentially um, have have access to the same the same uh, facilities within an office environment um, and end up paying less. So I do think that that's 
that's kind of the opportunity that we are certainly looking at and 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 the and the the uh the decision makers in business that we are you know we're going to be engaging with on thank you alan um richard uh any f final thoughts i mean what should investors be thinking about all of this i mean it's going to be a tough time um, uh, but we'll 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 get through through this uh, but any thoughts yeah i think just to everyone's point i mean this has really just accelerated what was already happening but accelerated it significantly um, we implemented something out of necessity and we've actually found that it's worked really well so I doubt we'll ever go back to our old model again. Um, and it's really around getting the balance right. Um, you know, if you could get your staff to work from home two days a week and in an office for three days of the week, um, it just helps everything in terms of, um, you know, work balance, work home life balance, um, less stress levels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, using smaller office space but managing to get more staff through there through rotation and, and flexi time and that type of stuff um i guess the economy is just how long this carries on for is how is how big the impact will ultimately be well, it's, a, it's a question of length thank you yeah. richard Bob, i saw your hand up uh, did you want to make a also a so, so it does it does raise the question then are we going to see a lot of conversion of office space to residential in mixed use decentralized nodes if you can get the building at the right price um, yeah. that's the the key thing you know obviously in terms of the residential market if you can bring affordable residential i'm not talking at the bottom end but anything sure. from 700 to 1.5 million into the city i think there will be a big demand for it. it's just trying to find properties at the right price that you can convert them to be able to sell at that level yeah. Well, fortunately, I don't, I don't a, a vacant that. building is usually rather cheap. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> what I also picked up, of course, is that you've got a lot of people who thought that the Airbnb was the answer, only to find themselves now with very empty flats. And, the, and these owners are now looking for a long-term lease, I suppose, as we all do, or as everybody would, would like to. I'd like to close the session and take this opportunity to thank you for a fascinating discussion. Really, I, th I think it took us into areas uh, that, that, that really show that, um, as they say, everything will be fine, but it will be different. Um, and I think that it's very true. Uh, we will get out of this. The world will look different. Um, so uh, a great thanks to Coin uh, for putting this together. Um, our intention is to do this in looking at different components uh, of the market, um, different sectors of the market. Um, and, and I think that a, a thread that will uh, be in these discussions that we're going to have with experts uh, in, in the market is really to untangle the some of the longer term trends and and to see those long term trends really facing us in the short term um, and it will probably be we'll see quite a number of these whether it's prop tech whether it is uh, the way that we not only the type of property but the way that we do property business um, may also alter um, in a world where the virtual world will get much closer to us probably then uh, and quicker than, than we actually thought. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much for your time. Alan, thank you very much for your time. And Rob, uh, thank you also for your insights and, and the questions. And we look forward to seeing you all back in the not distant future. Thank you very much.